One of those really important ACC-SEC rivalries to close out the season. We've got Georgia taking on Georgia Tech. We bring in Joey Weaver of, from the Rumble Seat on the uh, SB Nation platform for Georgia Tech football. Joey, thanks for joining us uh, post-Thanksgiving. Mark, good to be back. Always a pleasure. Definitely. So we didn't know so much about this football team just uh, several weeks ago, the last time we talked, and there have been a lot of uh, big wins that have been sued since then. Nine and two. Two losses within the conference, uh, good enough to wrap up that division championship and uh, kind of kick back and, and watch uh, Duke implode uh, late in the season and uh, wrap things up. So this obviously doesn't count toward the ACC. That's in place for next week, but this is the, the big rivalry. So um, what kind of marks rivalries from uh, in terms of the, the pregame fun is uh, maybe some bulletin board talk, whether that's going on between coaches and players or – Usually the fans uh, get a lot more creative and do some things. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's been just as fun a week as ever. Um, you know, as much as I think as much of that stuff kind of went on around the water cooler throughout you know the last century. I think the invention of social media has made that like really something else. Um, it's been some good shenanigans this week. I know that uh, some Georgia Tech fans bought up the uh, the URL, the domain WalmartAcademy.com for training Walmart employees. And they just redirected it to the uh, UGA homepage. Um, there was also a prank pulled yesterday on Thanksgiving. I think time so they were hoping that they wouldn't find it, but uh, they they added a little section into the UGA official I think athletics calendar, uh, and right under you know noon on Saturday it says football against Georgia Tech, and then there was another entry noon on Saturday you know get their rear ends kicked by Georgia Tech. Um, so a whole bunch of good fun hijinks. Um, and, you know, as much as we sit there and like to, you know, joke about them being a bunch of hillbillies with no teeth, they make fun of us being nerds, no social skills, no girls. It's all in good fun. So, um, <laughs> that, yeah, it's good week. yeah, and that comes into play in some of the trial for Royce where there's, yeah, a little bit better of an academic standard at one of the institutions, and, and the students love to to uh, make that uh, a little bit more emphasized. Well, all right. Uh, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that happens everywhere because last week they were doing the Harvard and Yale game and it was the same exact thing. They were making fun of each other for who was smarter. So, um, you know, some things never change, I guess. Yeah, that's one I, I couldn't even take a guess on because when you're number two in the country versus number three in academic standing or whatever it is, maybe it's one versus two. Yeah, that's that's a tough call to make. <laughs> well, in this one, Joey... Um, it's, it's difficult for me to relate to a non-conference rivalry. So we see it at uh, USC-Notre Dame. We see it a bunch of places. And, again, I mentioned all these ACC-SEC games, Kentucky-Louisville, Florida-Florida State, et cetera, and, and this game. So, so how is this one different than uh, taking on an ACC team that you know you have to beat to try to get to that championship game versus this is kind of the most hated rivalry, I guess? Yeah, this is definitely the one that – that, you know, tech fans are, I don't know what the word would be, but, you know, really just dislike the other fan base the most. And and I wrote an article about it last year, and I think a lot of it has to do with the proximity of the fans. Um, and it's, I think a little bit of it goes into, uh, you know, you look around at other teams and maybe they're much more separated geographically. Atlanta and Athens are separated by an hour and a half, and there's Really, when you look at the people in between them, there is no separation. I mean, Tech fans and Georgia fans are just constantly around each other. Um, and, you know, I, I remember growing up, you know, going to high school and middle school in that area. I mean, all of my teachers were Georgia grads. You know, there is there is no getting away from it. And I think that's where a lot of the hate really stems from is that between now and next year's game, whoever wins, there is no getting away from them, and you're just going to never hear the end of it. So... That's, I think that's where a lot of it really comes from and festers from. And, of course, Joey, I hate to bring it up, but for Georgia Tech fans, there's been a lot of trying to get away from Georgia fans after this game. 12 out of 13 under Mark Richt. Uh, so um, this would seem to be a pretty good shot, despite what the odds makers say, at uh, 12 or 13 points for, for Georgia, that Georgia Tech, uh, based on how you're playing, got to feel some level of confidence. Definitely. Well, and it was funny when that line came out was uh, it was on Sunday and immediately Twitter blew up with both Tech fans and Georgia fans alike. Like, that is way too big of a line. Um, I, I think that both sides agree that 
whoever wins this game, it probably won't be outside of 10 points. This should be a pretty competitive game. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's been a pretty rough going on decade and a half now. Um, but I, I definitely think that this is one of, one of the tech's better chances to, uh, to reverse that trend. Yeah, I don't know if it makes you feel any better, Joey, but uh, in my predictions every week, I make confidence picks, and that's one of the ones I, I grabbed up real quick was that Georgia Tech at 13 at the time uh, line. I think it's come back just a shade, but uh, that's pretty much what it is. And I was a bit surprised by that, obviously, as well. Um, I can understand, given Georgia Tech's non-conference schedule to date, um, and then also the ACC Coastal not being the best division in the world, but after manhandling Clemson, the way you did, and having that common opponent uh, factor in there. And, uh, you know, I expected a little bit more respect than that. All right, Joey, let's, uh, let's crack down on the nuts and bolts because this is always brought up when, when talking about Georgia Tech football, especially with an unfamiliar opponent, unfamiliar, quote-unquote, uh, to a certain extent, is, is the rushing attack, the, uh, the multiple... The, the facets involved of, of the rushing attack and, and Georgia bringing in a new defensive coordinator, Jeremy Pruitt, this season. Uh, just um, a, any thoughts that that could be a little bit more of an advantage than it typically would be? You know, maybe. Uh, the only thing that I, I wonder about is, I, I, I can't remember, I think he was also their defensive coordinator a couple of years ago when we played Florida State in the ACC championship game. Um, and so I, I'm thinking that this might not be the first time that he's seen seen this offense, had to prepare them for it. Now, it will be the first time that these players have prepared for the offense under this coordinator. Uh, so you might see some different schemes than what Todd Grantham was coming at us, at, coming at us with. But um, I, I do think that'll be an interesting aspect to watch. Hey, Joey, do you think uh, possibly Justin Thomas does a little bit too much in this attack? And the only reason I say that is because obviously – He's the guy at quarterback, and, and he's having a pretty good season throwing the football. He's, he's only turned it over through the air four times. Uh, the leading rusher as well. is that I, I know that's by design to a certain extent, of course. Uh, the quarterback has to be extremely um, integral to that rushing attack, but uh, being the leading rusher for this team, was, was that by design? You know, I really don't think so. I, I think a lot of where that's come from is – uh, his his unbelievable speed and acceleration. He's been able to break off some really big runs a lot of times. Uh, you know, if he if he can kind of get past that first level and into the secondary, I mean, it's it's a foot race. And, uh, and chances are, if he can get more than five yards, then he's picking up 15, 20 yards at a time. Um, and he did a, he did a a lot of that at NC State, just using his speed on the backside of a play to just run away from the defense. Um, and he's proved to, he's proved to be a handful to to, uh, to take down. And if anything, he's probably been a little too unselfish at times. You know, giving the ball away where he should have kept it. Um, he's definitely a playmaker, and, and I know that it looks like maybe he's trying to do too much himself. But it is an offense that, and he's very good at running the offense. But it's one where uh, you kind of got to take whatever the defense is giving you, and they they're really not going to be able to take away everybody. Uh, so if they're letting him beat him, then he's he's got to go do that. Yeah. So Justin Thomas at uh, 827 yards rushing, nine touchdowns. Then you got uh, Zach Lasky, six of eight and five touchdowns. Sinjin Days, 592 and three touchdowns. And I hope I don't mix up Lasky and Days because as I was following this a few weeks ago, Lasky got hurt, right? And then Sinjin Days got some uh, some uh, star time and re and really shown for a couple games. So so how would you expect to, to see that ball distribution between those guys? Yeah, so that uh, that happened a few weeks ago was Lasky went out with an injury, um, and that was at the end of a UNC game that was uh, was pretty frustrating for a lot of Tech fans. Uh, and, and with days coming in, a lot of people were speculating, you know, might they pull the red shirt of, of uh, C.J. Leggett, one of the red shirt freshman B-back guys. Uh, really didn't know how, how days was going to hold up. And next thing you know, he rips off three straight 100-yard games. And, I mean, there's really just a, a spark plug back there, the B-back. Um, made a lot of fans wonder what could have been if he had been a B-back his entire career. Um, and then last, last he came back for the Clemson game, uh, he ended up, I think, only having about four carries. And Days still got a, a majority of the workload. And I think 
I think it really was that big play potential that uh, that Days showed. You know, he r- ripped off a couple pretty long runs uh, that we hadn't seen from Lasky for whatever reason. Um, and so I, I expect to see something kind of similar to what we saw in the Clemson game where Days will get a majority of the carries, but there are definitely some things that Lasky can do that is, is pretty highly valuable as well. So they'll probably work him into the game plan in different ways um, when maybe when Days needs a breather or something. Yeah, now looking at the passing attack, you, you noted a few weeks ago when we talked that uh, Justin Thomas had more t- uh, passing touchdowns than any quarterback under Paul Johnson since he's taken over at Georgia Tech. Obviously, uh, DeAndre Smelter is the guy in the passing game that gets most of the targets, 32 receptions, 7 touchdowns. Um, I don't think this is much of a uh, concern for Georgia Tech because of the, the way the offense is run. Most teams, most top 15 or 20 teams, uh, have a number of targets. Sometimes we see one guy get targeted or two guys and they dominate the offense and it still somehow works. But uh, for most of the big-time teams, they've, they've just got droves of, of receivers after those two guys uh, that they can go to the four wide receiver sets. And a lot of guys are targets and you don't know where the ball's going. But, uh, I, again, I, I know I'm leading in the in the, the certain direction that uh, it's not that much of a concern, but he seems to be the guy that – it gets the targets, and, and is that uh, should that be distributed a little bit more? You talking about DeAndre Smelter? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. No. It's it's uh, that's definitely been the case. Is that so many of, of Thomas's pass attempts have gone to Smelter? I'd say if I had to guess, it would probably be in the forty to fifty percent range. Um, I don't I don't think it's a problem though. I mean, it's worked out really well. Um, Smelter is a big, physical, athletic. Um, he's you know, he's fast, he's got great hands, just a, a really good receiver that will probably end up playing on Sundays next year. Um, and, and he and Thomas have this great rapport, and I think that a lot of the reason it works is that Smelter is going to get a lot of one-on-one coverage in this offense, and and it is he is not an easy guy to cover, and so he's, he's able to consistently get separation and, uh, and, and break, come down with the ball, and so at that point... Um, you know, there hadn't been a whole lot of problems of balls getting intercepted. Uh, if anything, you know, the few passes that aren't complete, it's more often just the defensive back makes a great play on the ball. Um, even, even you know, without him, though, you've still got uh, Tony Zenon has caught a lot of passes out of the A-back position. And, uh, and Darren Waller, the wide receiver on the other side, has also caught quite a few balls. And uh, a guy who has kind of struggled through his career a little bit is really having a great year and, and realizing some potential that we knew he had. Um, so it, it's, it's amazing, I guess, the, the passing game of Georgia Tech being a conversation. You know, I, I would say that this is the most uh, most two-dimensional that this offense has been under Paul Johnson. Uh, I was listening to a radio show yesterday and this national host talking about Florida State's chances and saying, oh, well, Georgia Tech, they're just a one-dimensional team. You know, they, you know, Florida State can stop that. It's like, do your research because... Uh, not not so much the case this year. Thomas is throwing the ball well. He's in real good sync with his receivers, um, I, and I think that's going to be one element that that Georgia needs to be careful of. It could be the X factor in this game is if they can get a, a long touchdown on a pass or something, um, and that's and I think that's very possible with the way this attack has gone. There you go. Definitely, that's why I bring guys on like you because I don't want to misstep because I, I I know a little bit about everything, but I, I need to hear it from from guys like you, what's going on exactly right now, because those stereotypes last for a long time. So looking at the uh, defensive mindset for the Georgia Tech team, uh, Georgia, the Bulldogs, they've not done anything different schematically, but I I think there's a bit of a different emphasis uh, without Aaron Murray throwing to a number of uh, very skilled wide receivers. Uh, They always seem to have guys that are possibly ticketed to the NFL, and again, Aaron Murray an NFL quarterback, one of the better pocket passers we've seen in recent years, uh, chucking it 35 times. Now, same style offense, but now it's that sledgehammer and Nick Chubb coming at you. So how well is this Yellow Jacket defense built to uh, sustain that? They've been a little bit hot and cold against the run at times this year. There have been a couple games they've gotten gashed quite a bit. Um, I think there's other games that they've benefited from having a big lead where then teams are – throwing it more than they naturally would. Uh, the Pittsburgh game in particular comes to mind. Um, but I think if it's if it's something that they're focusing on is stopping the run, they've, they've typically had pretty good success against that. And and to me, that's 
I think that's the absolute key to this game is if Georgia Tech can contain Georgia's rushing attack, I personally do not think that Hudson Mason in the passing attack is good enough to win the game without without a rushing attack. Now, again, that's easier said than done. You've got Nick Chubb back there who is, uh, I think, every bit as nasty as Gurley was. Um, and who knows who else they might break out of there. I, I don't know who's injured and who's healthy, but they're all a pretty nasty set of running backs. Um, and I think in particular, you know, Chubb, uh, Chubb has done a lot where they'll, they'll, he'll break one tackle and then he's just off to the races. I mean, he, he was a track star in high school. He is fast. He's big. He's physical. Um, I think if, if you can't get him down the first time and if you, uh, if you can't tackle out on the perimeter in space, it's going to be a long day. Now, whether they can do that, I, I think that they can. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they will, though. All right, Joey, it's going to be interesting. Georgia, Georgia Tech, can't believe the Bulldogs are like a 12 or 13-point favorite, uh, but this Georgia Tech team trying to cap off what uh, for about six, seven weeks uh, looked like it was going to be a typical Georgia Tech season, but they uh, kept stringing the wins together, sitting at 9-2, and two, and regardless of what happens against the Bulldogs, of course you want to beat those hated rivals and get to double-digit wins. You're still going to be playing for a conference championship against a team that uh, is undefeated, continues to find a way, but is very much showing some flaws in the, against the likes of BC and some other teams like that. So going to be an exciting two weeks for you, Joey. We appreciate you uh, always coming on, breaking down uh, the Yellow Jackets for us. Yes, sir. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thanks.